Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the history of socialism. On this episode, we will be covering Rojava, or as it's now known, the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, a very recent libertarian left uh, government set up in the Syrian civil war. So, without further ado, let's begin. First, some history. Northern Syria has been the home of Kurds for centuries now. Uh, Kurds also live in southeastern Turkey and northwestern Iraq. Uh, their history has not been a good one of recent, uh, due to the fact that after the world wars were over and Europe redrew the Middle East border, Kurds were not given a state. This meant that the states that were formed tried to forcibly indoctrinate them into their state, which caused quite a bit of tension. Uh, even so far as ethnic cleansing by some of its neighbors, especially Turkey. However, focusing specifically on the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, their history begins uh, at the Civil War. Prior to the Civil War, uh, the Kurdish inhabited areas were ruled directly from Damascus, with laws preventing Kurds from owning property, driving cars, working certain professions, some even lost citizenship. Kurdish people couldn't form political parties, the language was made illegal to teach, hospitals lacked equipment, and there was forced Arabization and adoption of the culture, as I previously mentioned. The High Commissioner of the UN Human Rights Council, in its 12th session, said that successive Syrian governments continue to adopt a policy of ethnic discrimination and national persecution against Kurds, completely depriving them of their national, democratic, and human rights, an integral part of human existence. The government imposed ethnically-based programs, regulations, and exclusionary measures on various aspects of Kurds' lives, political, economic, social, and cultural. Once the Syrian civil war broke out, however, the Syrian army withdrew from the Kurdish region to go deal with the civil war, which included factions such as those that were opposing Assad's government and then later ISIS. So Kurdish militias were left in control of the region, and the withdrawing of Syrian troops allowed for underground Kurdish political parties to take advantage. The main two parties that took advantage and announced the state were the Democratic Union Party, which is the libertarian left party we'll be talking about, and the Kurdish National Council, which was a center-right party. They formed the Kurdish Supreme Committee. Uh, the Supreme Committee formed its own military, uh, called the YPG, which is uh, the People's Protection Units and its own state. In 2013, the Democratic Union Party established a coalition called the Movement for a Democratic Society, which is left-wing and a grassroots coalition. Basically, they are the main group in charge of the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria, which I will from now on, because that is a mouthful, refer to as the DFNS. The Kurdish Supreme Committee was dissolved in 2015 to found the Syrian Democratic Council, and there was a new constitution in 2016, which was supported by all except for Kurdish nationalists who wanted to form their own state of Kurdistan. So, what does the DFNS believe? Well, the state is based on the ideas of a man named Abdullah Ocalan. Uh, he's currently imprisoned in Turkey. But basically, it believes in the society that's not built on state institutions, but on collective security, communalism, direct democracy. Uh, this is specifically called democracy without a state. Uh, they have such policies such as a co-governance policy, where each position at each level of government has a female equivalent of equal authority to male, equal political representation of all ethno-religious groups. Because Northern Syria is a very multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, area, there are uh, Muslims, Christians, Yazidi, those who speak Kurdish, those who speak Arabic, those who speak Syriac even. Uh, so that was actually built into the Constitution 2014, that is, uh, freedom of religion and gender equality. Now, Ocalan did not form these ideas spontaneously. He actually got them from reading a specific American libertarian socialist named Murray Bookchin while he was in prison. I'll do my own video on Bookchin himself, because he's an interesting man, but basically Bookchin was an anarchist for a long time. He wrote books on post-scarcity anarchism, the history of anarchism in Spain, which is another topic I'll cover. However, he eventually denounced our anarchism as being too much about living a lifestyle and not enough about concrete action to change society. He created an idea called communalism to more echo the society of anarchist Spain and a realistic concrete idea of how a left libertarian state could be formed. 
Unfortunately, he died in 2006, so he never got to see how his ideas performed under praxis instead of just theory. So, what's the current state of the DFNS? Well, right now they're currently developing their schooling system, which is pretty good for the situation. In it, uh, they're taught uh, in primary education and native language with mandatory teaching of the other native language. The two native languages are Kurdish and Arabic, and English is taught as a third language, mandatory. Teaching is now in three languages as well, Kurdish, Arabic, and also fairly newly Syriac. They have two universities, uh, University of Afrin and Rojava. They have a free press, but it's threatened by Syria. Uh, and their economic policy is somewhat interesting, though still not Bookchin or Okalon's full imagination. Uh, right now it's mostly co-ops with some private enterprise. Uh, though they do have a plan to implement Okalon's ideas under the People's Economy Plan, or PEP, which wants to replace capitalism with democratic confederalism, which doesn't necessarily abolish private property as traditional socialist uh, doctrine says to, but rather uh, protects private property under the idea of ownership by use, in which if you don't use the land, like how in America people just own land for the sake of it and later sell it, then it's no longer protected. Much of the economic activity, approximately three quarters, is done through communes and co-ops, especially agriculture. There's actually also no taxes that would go against uh, communalist ideology. Instead, the government raises money through tariffs and through selling oil directly rather than through taxes. So, what's the future of the DFNS? Well, uh, the supporters of the DFNS constitution, not including the previously mentioned uh, Kurdish nationalist movement, wants its model to be applied to Syria as a whole rather than independence, uh, which makes sense as it's built on multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, identity. However, it doesn't look very good for the future of uh, the DFNS, because in the near future it looks as if Assad will be the victory, Assad being Bashar al-Assad, leader of Syria, uh, looks to be the victor of the Syrian civil war relatively soon, and he would not support Rojava as he is an authoritarian leader. It seems unlikely they will persist, but it also seems unlikely they'd survive ISIS, so who knows. Speaking of ISIS, uh, the Rojava is actually one of the best fighters against ISIS. Uh, they formed up with the PKK uh, and their military wing. The PKK is the Kurdish Workers Party, which is active in Iraq and in Turkey, where they're deemed a terrorist organization. They've teamed up with other Kurdish groups to defeat ISIS. They are quite effective, and in fact, uh, I'm surprised that American press hasn't really capitalized on the fact that there are all women's units who are kicking ISIS's ass, and it's fantastic. Uh, however, as I said, it doesn't look good for them, as the authoritarian Assad will likely win the civil war with Russia's backing, uh, which could spell doom for the DFNS. But hopefully not, and we'll see where it goes. And I think that's it for this episode, so I'll see you next time. Hope you enjoyed.